welcome to this episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Mira, I'm an ADF Product Manager working for Oracle Corporation. Now in today's episode and the next episode, we're going to look at adding logging or instrumentation to your ADF applications. Specifically in this episode, we're going to look at designing your logging. So not just, just adding it anywhere, but actually thinking about how you add sufficient or good logs to your application. But also in addition, we'll look at, well, where you should possibly add logging in terms of the ADF framework. So some of the discussions today are very generic from a design of your logging infrastructure, but others will be more specific to ADF applications that we are interested on in the ADF Architecture TV channel. So let's start out in considering uh, logging and consider the question of why should you add logging or instrumentation to your applications? And there's really three viewpoints I'd like to address. That of the developer, I guess you and me, that of system administrators, and that of, well, maybe end users. So from a developer perspective, why do you want to add logging? Because, hey, JDeveloper has a very sophisticated debugger in it. You can add breakpoints, you can step through lines of code, you can see the current value for variables. Why would you need logging at all? Well, you can't actually debug a production ADF application. Putting the debugger on, putting in a breakpoint, and stopping all users hitting your production system, obviously, is not a great idea. So adding logs to our ADF applications, any application really, gives us, as de uh, developers, a lot of supplemental information about, well, what our programs are doing, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. And via the logs, you often, well, I do, I must admit, I look at patterns in the logs. I tend to understand that a successful route through my application will have a certain set of logs. I'll look at that as a pattern, and then when things go wrong, I'll go, oh, that looks different from previous, and then I'll investigate the logs where things have gone wrong. Now, putting the developer's perspective aside, let's think about, well, the staff will have to deal with your ADF applications when you're gone. And let's admit it, our goal as ADF developers is to write systems that will live a lot longer than necessarily our employment at a particular organisation. And when those applications do go wrong, it's usually system administrators or DevOps staff who then have to work out why it's gone wrong. Now, those staff will not necessarily have any ADF skills. Okay? They won't have the level of skills that you've built up over one to five years. Basically, they might be administrating a WebLogic server, they might be administrating a whole bunch of servers, and then basically getting a report and says, this is broken, can you find out why? Now, how a system administrator or DevOps person does that on an ADF application is just like any other type of application out there, like mm, the Apache web server. They don't look at the source code. Typically, they go in and look at the logs. So here's another reason for instrumenting and logging your code to assist the system administrators and, uh, I guess, assist the support staff who have to look after your application when you're long gone. The third reason or group that we should consider logging from, and it's not really logging to assist them, but it's logging to assist you, is that of end users. Have you ever been in a situation where you've got a phone call from an end user or a support request where the user said, the system's not working, can you tell me why? And your response to that is, well, can you tell me why it's not working and the steps to reproduce it and any other information? and you quickly get a response back from them as, I don't know, I just did this and then it all just broke. And you're going, oh, can you please give me some more information about what you did? We need a re reproducible test case. Now, I'm sure as a developer, you've been put in that situation previously, and you know that end users often can't articulate problems as well as we can. So having logs can obviously assist us in working out why things are going wrong, even though the user can't well necessarily discuss why to us in the terms that we need to hear. Also remember, in terms of talking to end users, that us, Oracle, or I should say development staff, IT staff in general, not just Oracle employees, but IT staff in general tend to be very logical minded. In fact, my wife is always saying, I hope my children don't end up as logical as you. It frustrates me. But in the end, we are very logical. Oracle developers, normal developers, IT stuff. We're very logical in the way that we approach things. So when we get a request from a user that something doesn't work, so say you're working in the same building and you walk down the floors to wherever the end user lives in your building, say, can you show me the problem? Give me all the steps. I want to know exactly A, B, C what you did. <laughs> 
our logical mindset can not only be hard for, let's say, a general end user to equate. A lot of those end users may only be working at the corporation part time. This is not a big deal to them. It is a big deal to you because your professional life is based around debugging these sort of problems. But to them, they might start to feel a bit under stress as you're in saying, I oh, know you've got to tell me exactly how you did this. Did you click this and this? And it can become a little bit aggressive. So in human nature, it's quite well documented that in fact, when people are, um, have to do a plea at court or a plea in front of police officers about, did you do this? Often people confess to the wrong thing. They didn't actually commit the crime or they'll just make stuff up because they feel so under pressure. And that's true of our end users too. They might actually give us something wrong, not give us enough information. They might lie or they might just make stuff up in order to get us off their backs. So logging instrumentation can be a very good tool from our developer's perspective for backing us up when we can't get very reasonable information out of the end users of what actually went wrong. So at this point, hopefully we've convinced you of the need to add logging to your applications, be they normal applications or ADF applications. But an interesting question that then gets raised typically is what shall we log? Should we absolutely log everything that happens in our application? Every function call, everything that, well, if something gets called, a variable gets changed, oh, all these different things. Well, truthfully, no, you don't just add huge amounts of logging because then the problem is, is when you turn your logs on, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. There's just so much information that now you can't actually see the problems from all the logs that are in there. So in terms of logging, there is some things that you need to consider. Logging, there is an art of design to good logging. Firstly, one of the things you can, should consider is the placement of your logs. Okay, at which point in your actual application are you going to log something, okay? Second from there is, well, not all logs are born equal. Some logs, well, critical errors should always be logged. But other logs may be more informational. You know, oh, the program's just doing something, I'm just telling you about it. And so you should consider when creating your logs that the different levels of the logs are going to be raised. Next, of course, which is also very important, is, well, what detail is actually in the log. Okay, and that really then goes on to the last point. You need to consider who's consuming the logs as well, because different types of staff will need different pieces of information. So just to articulate that in a little bit more detail, think of your end user. Now your end user, when something goes wrong, will want to see an error message, okay? They want to be told that. But do they need all the information about what the system is doing at that time? Do they need to know what procedures and functions are being called? What task flows are currently being run? No, they don't. That information is totally superfluous to them. Now, however, in terms of, let's say, support or admin staff, they actually, when things go wrong, probably need a bit more detail about why things have gone wrong. So, for example, in Java, how, you know, the, the biggest common error is a null pointer exception. They probably need to know about the null pointer exception and also the stack trace. Then finally, if we consider you or me, the developer, well, from a logging perspective, we probably want a lot more information. Maybe we do want to know about all the band of task flows called and all the functions and procedures and so on and so forth. And maybe we also want to know about the state transition of particular variables or parameters passed to the band of task flows. In order for us to use the logs successfully, we need a lot more information than, let's say, the end user that we talked about earlier. Okay, so let's discuss some more rules about adding logging to your application. Now, as we said, don't overlog. Don't log absolutely everything, or, you know, like I described, you'll end up with the drinking from a high, uh, fire hose problem. Also, another thing to consider is, well, do you need to translate your, all your log messages? Now, definitely for the log messages or the error codes that hit your users, well, potentially you do. But for, say, log messages where you're just passing up errors from the ADF framework, I'm not sure you really want to translate those because when you get those ADF errors, okay, so maybe, maybe it's something like ADFC-06004, the task flow um, transaction is not open on the data control frame. 
that particular error message there well if it was translated into your local language and you went and searched for it in Google you're probably unlikely to find a hit but if you go and search for it using the English term that it was originally written in by Oracle Corp remember all our error messages are English or American English by default on Google you're much more likely to be able to find that error message so not all logs need to necessarily be translated another thing to do is think about supportability in terms of your logs, it's quite useful to add an error or warning code to those. And the reason being is just like we described is often searching for the full error message is quite hard to do. Having an error code or a warning code, much easier to search for it. But of course, you need to then, if you've got specific logs or error codes that your application is raising, you need to document them more than just the error message. Give more information about why the situation has occurred in your actual application. In addition then, of course, well, you don't necessarily need to give more information about config or info messages. Adding more documentation about those, well, it's kind of defeating the purpose. A config or an info message really should be self-supporting. Another thing to consider is for very complex log statements. So say you have a log statement that has to do a bunch of calculations and a bunch of code to even get the log statement together. Maybe you need to go and fetch a bunch of um, values and you maybe need to get something from the database. If your logs are currently turned off and you're still doing all that log gathering as such, well, that's going to basically cost your application a bunch of performance. So in that case, you might want to put a conditional statement around that set of log statements that says, hey, if the log is on, then let's certainly do all this computation. But otherwise, if the log is off, let's just skip it all. Some further logging rules you might like to consider is, well, if the framework or your application raises an exception, always log the exception, even if it happens to be reported up to the user. The reason you'll need to do that is because the user might come back to you and say, hey, I saw this problem, this exception, and you'll go, no worries, I'll go and look in the logs. And you'll see all your other logs, but you can't actually see the exception when it occurred in the logs. So you can't correlate with what the user is telling you. Another thing to consider is don't use logging as an audit. And often I've seen this requirement previously where auditors come along and say, you've got to add all this logging code to your application so we can work out exactly what the users were doing and we can bust them if they weren't doing the right thing. Now the problem with relying on the logs as an audit is, well, the server administrators can turn it off. And this instantly basically creates a mechanism where, well, you can't satisfy the auditor's requirements. So a reasonable question from here is, what to actually log? Well, as we said, error conditions, right? The exceptions that are thrown, what we just talked about. But another example of something that's good to log is, well, parameter changes. Now, you know, in languages like Java, we have functions that take parameters. So logging the values of the parameters going in is probably very useful. But also in context of, say, ADF, we've got bounded task flows, and they take parameters as well, input and output parameters. So logging those would be useful. Why are they useful? Well, with the values coming in and out, let's say you can see certain values for the input of a bounded task flow, you could actually, as a developer, take those input values and then replay them on your own development PC on JDeveloper to see if you can get the same error conditions that have been occurring that have been affecting a user. Another area to consider in terms of logging or where to log though is, well, just be careful where you actually add your logs in terms of say the JSF lifecycle or maybe a HTTP servlet or something similar to that. Because for say the JSF lifecycle, if you add logging in the JSF lifecycle on a particular phase, that's going to be every page request for every user that comes in. And that could have an impact on the performance of your system. So certainly there are a lot of things we want to log, but maybe we shouldn't be putting logs in every single location in our code. Okay, so we've got a bit of a general idea of now where to add logs, but what about the ADF framework itself? Is there any guidelines we can give you? Well, let's consider ADF business components to start out with. Now, the view object impool has a method, and I'll just look at my notes very quickly, called bind parameters for collection. Now that method is one that gets called every time a bind variable for your view object and the associated view criteria gets set. 
So just like we said before that you want to log parameter changes to functions, well, if we equate a view object to a function, now you can actually log the different bind variable values coming through, the different parameters as such for that view object. Another alternative, hey, the application module, you could put bindings, I should say loggings on methods like do checkout for watching the application module pooling behavior, or on the prepare session method because you're setting PL SQL state, uh, state session variables. Okay, there's all sorts of logging you can put in there. And if you remember that one of our clear recommendations from Oracle Corporation is that for ADF business components, you should create your own set of custom extension classes from the oracle.jbo server classes. One of the major advantages if you now do that is you as the senior developer can add additional logging into that set of classes and now your normal developers, your junior developers, don't have to put that logging across all their individual ADF business component classes. And you get a very consistent logging footprint, you can turn on and off and basically the junior developers don't have to do a bunch of additional work there to get that instrumentation into place. Now talking about junior programmers, another area that they get very confused in is the life cycle of managed beans within the Java server faces or ADF faces uh, area of the ADF framework. When beans get instantiated, is it every request, is it over the life of a banner task flow, this can become a problem for them, particularly when they're starting out. So a really obvious place to add logging in the framework is on the constructors of your managed beans. And I must admit, I've found situations when I've found, hey, I didn't expect that managed bean to be reinstantiated at that point. Ah, that's why we're getting a null pointer exception, because that other bean assumes this guy would have been still alive, but no, he's been reset, he's been restarted, and some of his values have been wiped out. This is a very valuable logging point in the ADF framework. Let's go a little bit further afield. Okay, we've got the ADF controller, task flows. We already mentioned task flows, import and output parameters, beautiful place to log. But also error handlers in task flows. Again, they're a place where you can capture error conditions, capture those error conditions and write them off to the logs. So lots of good places you can actually add logs in the ADF framework. Now, just reminding myself there by looking at my notes, I also remember that Frank, Frank Nymphius, in a previous episode, has talked about overriding the DC error handler impl class, and that's again another great place for you to add logs. So the ADF framework does give you a lot of places you can add logs if you so desire, but questionably, is there some places that you shouldn't add logging? Now, we've already talked about parts of the framework where, hey, say there's um, the JSF lifecycle for every request, thousands of requests coming in, you'll probably end up with thousands of logs and that will probably be too much for your application. But another thing to remember is that the ADF framework is in turn already instrumented. And we'll see in the next episode when you have a look at the ADF logger and we look at the Oracle diagnostic logging screen within JDeveloper, we can turn on numerous amounts of logging points within the actual framework for getting additional information. So the rule here is, is don't log what the framework's already logging. Though in saying that, I must clearly say, well, I must confess, I should be, would be the better term here. The problem with the Oracle uh, logging and instrumentation in the framework that already exists, it goes back to that drinking from a fire hose problem. When you turn it on, there's just so much information coming out that in a way that you just want to turn it off and add your own logging to some points in your overall solution that get the information that you want. So I hope that's given you some valuable information on where to add logs to your ADF application. So there is a degree of design and maybe even art to adding logs to a typical application. In the next episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel, we're going to be looking at the ADF logger specifically. Okay, the ADF logger, some design considerations from using the ADF logger. And we'll also look at some of the other Fusion middleware considerations in terms of logging and something called the ECID look at the Oracle Diagnostic Logging Tool and something called the ADF Request Tracing Tool. Now typically we cover those topics in an ADF Insider Essentials episode, they're more like let's go down and actually have a look at the tool, but it's so valuable here to include this information, that's why we'll cover it in its own episode. So thanks again for joining us on the ADF Architecture TV channel, we hope you've enjoyed today's episode and once again we look forward to seeing you very very soon.